Malaysia's controversial new security law comes into effect. It gives Prime Minister Najib Razak sweeping powers. His government says the law is needed to confront growing security challenges. But what will it mean for Malaysia's democracy? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to Inside Story. I'm Sahil Rahman. A new security law in Malaysia came into force on Monday, one that critics say gives the government broad, unchecked powers. It allows for authorities to create a so-called security zone inside which arrests and seizures can happen without warrants. Some say the government could use this law to ward off political and legal challenges. But Prime Minister Najib Razak says the security law is crucial for protecting Malaysian citizens. We'll get to our guests in a moment. But first, Al Jazeera's Karishma Vyar sets up our discussion from Kuala Lumpur. The law gives a council headed by Prime Minister Najib Razak the power to declare security areas at times when they believe that there's a heightened security threat in Malaysia. Now, in these areas, police and soldiers have the power to search and arrest people without a warrant, to seize property without a warrant and to prevent demonstrations from occurring. Now, this, these sweeping laws have raised alarms uh, amongst the opposition as well as human rights groups who say it could be misused. I'm not suggesting that he would do it. I'm not suggesting he, he would abuse it. But the worry is it opens the door for such a big abuse to actually take place. The Prime Minister is in a very precarious position. He has been plagued by scandal after scandal. He's accused of siphoning almost $700 million from a state investment fund. Now, he has denied any wrongdoing, but the Department of Justice in the US has launched civil lawsuits related to this fund. What rights groups fear is that he may use this new law to stay in power and quash his critics. Now, in preparation for this programme, we reached out to several members of Malaysia's parliament, including the Prime Minister, ministers and press secretaries, and they were all unable to join us. But they did direct us to the Prime Minister's statement on this new law. Here's some of what he had to say, and I quote, We were criticised for passing these laws, including by some who fear-mongered for political reasons. The National Security Council Act in particular has been deliberately misinterpreted. It is not the same as a declaration of national emergency. That, that power remains with His Majesty Yang Di Pachun Agong and Parliament remains sitting with oversight on any security area declared. Now, the Malaysian government says the National Security Council Act is in response to a growing imminent threat of an attack. Last month, police arrested more than 200 people for allegedly being connected to armed groups. That was after a grenade attack at a bar in June. Eight people were injured and Malaysian authorities linked that attack to ISIL. And there's been an increase in attacks by the Philippines-based armed group Abu Sayyaf in northeastern Malaysia. It's kidnapped and murdered foreign tourists and Malaysian citizens. Well, time now to bring in our guests. In Kuala Lumpur, we have Eric Paulson, Executive Director of Lawyers for Liberty. In London, Claire Rucastle-Brown, Editor of the Sarawak Report. And also in Kuala Lumpur, joining us via Skype is Azrul Mohammed Khalib, Manager of External Relations at the Institute for Democracy and Economic Affairs, known as IDEAS. Welcome to all of my guests. It's good to have you on Inside Story. Let's begin with you, Azrul, uh, in Kuala Lumpur, emergency powers that Malaysians perhaps have never seen the like of before. Just as a citizen, what's your initial reaction to what you're hearing? Uh, honestly, uh, when we first heard that this law was going to be introduced into Parliament, we really didn't know what to think of it. Uh, for many of those who are uh, pro-opposition, uh, we can't help but think that perhaps this is yet another piece of legislation that's being used as an instrument uh, to counter the opposition or those who are perhaps um, not in support of the current administration. Do you think the public at uh, large, though, the, the ordinary man on the street, I mean, you're, you're telling us what, you know, the, the academics may think, but do you actually think the ordinary man on the street really knows how this is going to impact on him or his family and friends on a day-to-day -day basis? 
Well, the ordinary man on the street, really, to be honest, doesn't really uh, fully understand or perhaps even care that such a law exists, uh, which uh, they will probably buy into the government's explanation, which is uh, for the interests of public safety and security, mm -hmm. particularly on the issue of terrorism. Okay, well, let's bring in Eric Paulson, uh, a very eminent lawyer and quite a critic of, of the government. Uh, Eric, put your legal side just you know, to, to, to one side, and, and as I asked Azrul, your initial reaction and the reaction that you hear from your family and friends around you speaking about what's going on right now and this law. Well, uh, basically for me, uh, it, it came uh, quite quite at, at, um, you know, at a shock because um, no one has actually heard about this particular bill uh, until it was actually tabled in Parliament. Um, it was drafted in haste, uh, in secrecy, without any consultation with anyone. Um, and then within three days, uh, the uh, bill was uh, pushed through Parliament. Um, and uh, despite the reservation and concerns raised by uh, many, many parties, including uh, uh, the Malaysian uh, bar, uh, civil society, and even uh, the conference of rulers, uh, nonetheless, uh, the authorities push ahead uh, and pass the laws. Claire in London, uh, you've been writing on Malaysia and uh, affairs in uh, Malaysia for many years uh, through your online publication. Um, sometimes it's been highly critical of the government uh, and they of you as well. In terms of what uh, you're hearing coming out of Malaysia, knowing the country so well, what's your initial reaction to the way this law has been rushed through Parliament uh, as something, uh, and as Eric mentioned, but also the way it, it may be implemented just in general terms for now? Well, I think we've already seen an immediate impact in uh, the way it's affected uh, Malaysians on the street, actually. Um, we in the past have seen uh, very large demonstrations of Malaysians um, exercising their right uh, to protest about issues that concern them, in particular corruption and uh, election uh, uh, rigging. And this, the, we've had several, several demonstrations organized, for example, by the Bursay Group and by the opposition. And in response to the um, extraordinary allegations that were made last week by the Department of Justice relating to corruption in the uh, 1MDB development fund, um, many people in Malaysia, uh, certainly that I've been in contact with, have been thinking about, again, exercising their right to uh, express concern about these issues um, openly mm -hmm. in protest on the streets. Um, and they are very intimidated now. Um, they've been told by the chief of police that they can't uh, demonstrate because um, that will be seen as criticism of the government and that's not allowed anymore. Um, they've been told that if any of their protests are um, with an intention to topple the government, as the chief of police has put it, then they will not be granted permission. And at the moment they are very nervous about whether or not to go ahead with peaceful demonstrations mm. in Malaysia. So I think it's wrong to say that there's been no impact okay. uh, from this law. Sure. Well, let's go back to uh, Eric, because uh, obviously we, one wonders when these sorts of laws are enacted how the international community is going to react. And while governments have at the moment perhaps stayed quiet because they don't know how to react or haven't really been able to read into the fine detail, uh, you and human rights watchers, civil society groups inside and outside of Malaysia say they're deeply concerned. We have statements here on my desk about the move. It, the, move the act is all about in the name of security. Is it justified? We have seen attacks in Malaysia, not just in June, but a spate of arrests of suspects over the last 18 months. The government has a point, doesn't it? Well, um, we certainly don't uh, discount uh, the, the threat uh, that is uh, faced by Malaysia. But I think uh, we have to look uh, at the act uh, uh, much more closer uh, because I think uh, it is very easy for the authorities to pull wool uh, over the eyes of the Malaysian public by saying, uh, you know, you just have to trust us. Uh, this is all for, for your own good in the name of national security. Uh, if we look at the, the actual uh, uh, threats uh, posed by uh, this uh, individual uh, 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 young men, uh, we are talking about individual uh, acting and, and the Malaysian police have actually acted uh, very well by arresting hundreds of them um, and certainly we have enough laws uh, including uh, uh, Security uh, Offences Special Measures Act, we have uh, uh, POTA, these uh, uh, preventive laws that can detain uh, someone for up to two years. 
uh, our Malaysian authorities are, are fully empowered to arrest, charge and detain individuals for individual acts of, uh, uh, of, uh, ter of terrorism. Uh, and certainly we don't really need such uh, uh, wide-ranging uh, laws whereby the Prime Minister solely uh, on advice by the Council can actually declare a whole area which is, can be as, as large as a state Mm. Uh, to be a security area. So uh, it, it doesn't really correspond with the actual threat faced by Malaysia. Uh, Azrael, would you agree with that? I certainly would. Um, I think when it comes down to it, the rationale for the existence of this kind of legislation hasn't been fully articulated by the authorities, especially since there are already existing legislation that already can do the job several times over. I think uh, when the government was asked, uh, it responded by saying, that because of the recent uh, incursions by Abu Sayyaf and of course the Lahad Datu uh, incident, uh, it has been trying to basically say that these new legislations necessary in order to deal with this kind of threat to Malaysia. But uh, I have to uh, echo uh, Eric there that we are worried that instead of it being used for purposes in which it has been articulated as being used for terrorism, it will instead be used on human rights defenders and civil society actors. And we'll, we'll continue that in a moment, but uh, Claire, you're also nodding your head. But I also want to add, haven't the parameters changed on the ground? I mean, it's all very well for Eric to say, yes, individuals have been arrested. And as I said, we've been trying to get a government voice on this programme and they've said no. So one has to sort of put the government's perhaps position forward in that the world has changed. Social media, text messaging, iPads have allowed terror groups to communicate a lot better than they did 10 or 15 years ago. So therefore, the, the maybe the powers that are needed are needed on a much higher level rather than just the local police who can arrest people for uh, alleged um, acts against the state or against a county or, or, or a smaller target. I think you have to look at how powers have been used. Um, in order to tackle that kind of um, online terrorism, you need an intelligent, an intelligence-based approach. Um, how have they used uh, their new online media laws? Well, they've, they've used it to crack down on people like me and my website. Um, I'm not a terrorist. Um, I have been charged under terrorism-related laws in Malaysia um, because I've been critical of the Prime Minister. And, and, and I would just say at this point that um, all that criticism has been wholly vindicated in the past week by the DOJ's own announcement. So I think it's a very genuine concern because of how these laws have been used, that they will be abused. Um, and very many people, as have been pointed out by numerous civil rights groups and the United Nations itself and the United States State Department, you know, the, these laws are being used against civil rights um, individuals, campaigners and groups and people have been imprisoned in Malaysia on an unprecedented scale over the past uh, year under these laws, not for terrorism reasons but for criticising the Prime Minister. This is why people are concerned. Um, also, you, uh, you mentioned earlier that, um, you know, that the, the, the Prime Minister has said this is not emergency legislation. Um, it effectively bypasses the emergency legislation um, that does indeed have to be um, supervised by the sovereign. So he now basically has his own personal uh, emergency law that doesn't need to go past the sovereign. Now this is extremely relevant because you referred to how this law was rushed through Parliament without any warning on the last day of the session at the end of last year, uh, bulldozed through without any scrutiny at all, any opportunity for amendments, and the Council of Rulers and the Sovereign have refused to authorise it. They've refused to sign off on this, on this act. Um, and the only reason that Najib has been able to bring it in today has been because he has used um, an amendment to the Constitution that enables the government to bulldoze through uh, acts that the Sovereign has refused to sign off. Um, the Council of Ruler asked for the, the law to be looked at again and refined because they were so concerned. Well, that's, so the, that's almost unprecedented. And that gives us perhaps a, a basis for, for perhaps moving on from exactly how the government have managed to uh, get this act in, in operation. Because 
we then have to go back again back to security and, and the reasons for why this act is there. And if I just go back 18 months uh, in Malaysia, I remember at a time when I was there too, you had ISIL warning its supporters not to use Malaysian airports as a springboard to go into the Middle East and fight in any of the conflicts in the Middle East or, or North Africa. There are precedents, there are examples that the government in Malaysia, in Putrajaya, can turn around to the public and say, this is happening now. We have threats in our own country of people being inspired to go and fight in, in these locations sure. thousands of miles away. Eric Paulson, do, the government does have a real, the government does have a real concern, doesn't it? Um, well, I fully agree. Uh, but again, as I've said, uh, there are enough laws uh, uh, whereby uh, individuals have been arrested. So I don't really see how uh, this uh, National Security Council Act can actually uh, assist the government in arresting these individuals. Are because, as I've said... Are you then saying uh, that... I'm going to interrupt powers, then. Are you, I'm going to interrupt the powers, you then. Uh, I'm going to interrupt you, Eric, because then I want to just then ask you, is it because the parameters of the new act haven't been... Uh, explained well enough to the public and to other lawmakers, including those that actually abide, um, have to adhere to the law and, and see it through, i.e. the police officers uh, and those that would actually use the act to, to arrest people. Does that need to be explained better? Well, well the laws are very wide-ranging. It is all uh, there for us uh, to see. Uh, the language is extremely ambiguous. Um, you know, previously, uh, similar laws uh, have been enacted under the Internal Security Act, but that has been abolished. Uh, so what happened is they have lifted a similar provision under the old ISA, whereby the threshold is much higher, uh, whereby it required uh, organised violence, uh, whereby there are large numbers of people in, involving in you know, some, some sort of arms uh, insurrection. Uh, what happened is currently, as it stands now, the language is extremely loose. It talks about threats by any person uh, against the economy, against uh, key infrastructure and other interests. And what amounts to national security is not defined. Uh, so as if I, like, if, I like, if I can echo what uh, Claire said earlier, uh, presumably uh, a large number of peaceful gatherings like Berse uh, could be interpreted as uh, national, uh, you know, in the interest of national security, whereby it could be a threat uh, 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 to, the, to the government and uh, a whole area can be declared um, a security area and anything goes in this particular area. Somebody could be shot and killed and there will be no repercussion. Buildings can be demolished, uh, curfew can be imposed. Uh, how do you justify that in this day and age? Okay, so therefore I think we can talk about all the ambiguities in the grey areas. Azra, let me bring you in here and let's move the conversation sure. slightly uh, uh, to another uh, very important part that we need to really clarify is the real concern about radicalism uh, because this is the underlying argument that the government will continue to uh, project publicly. So let's talk about this now. And radicalism in Malaysia, it is a problem um, and there is an issue of those that are supporting it. What? Uh, how do you see the issue of radicalism and how would you describe it to a global audience watching this programme about the problem in Malaysia compared to other countries? Well, it's, radicalism is an ongoing problem and I think it is different uh, in each country that we see it happening. And one thing we see in Malaysia is there being an increasing Islamization of many of the secular uh, entities, institutions from schools all the way up to uh, public uh, institutions, uh, civil service, even up into the military, where there is a much more, em much, uh, more stronger emphasis on religion and less of secular instruments such as the federal constitution. And what we are seeing is a radicalization in which they believe that in order for them to be carrying out the work uh, of God or in the interest or in the aims of Islam, what they want to be able to do is to demonstrate their faith. And this is one of the things that we're seeing where more and more people are being uh, enticed or encouraged or perhaps even drawn into wanting to go to the Middle East and be a uh, militant or to be part of ISIL or even, even to be encouraged to do those acts here in the region or in Malaysia itself. So what we're seeing today is a radicalization that is rooted upon a perhaps a misunderstanding or an extreme interpretation of uh, Islam as a religion within the context of Malaysia. Mm -hmm. And the problem here is, is that the government itself 
has been sending mix, mixed messages when it comes to this issue because it feels itself needing to prove that it's an is Islamic country, it has an Islamic identity, and therefore unable to perhaps curb some of the much more extreme uh, expressions of faith sure. that have been starting to come about in this country. And because of that, we're starting to see a more, if I may say, exports of Malaysian citizens from the middle class even, who are going off to fight in the Middle East as ISIL fighters. Okay, so then let me bring, let me bring in Eric then, because uh, just very briefly, I can see you're nodding, Claire, in agreement. I'll come to you in a moment. Eric, then, you've been very vocal about this, about why the authorities haven't been able to clamp down on this or there is no will to clamp down on this. What's your opinion about why there can be such extremist vocal uh, sentiment in the public arena and the government say nothing? Um, well, I think uh, the uh, government is trying to have it both ways. Uh, you know, Islam is a very powerful tool in Malaysia, and uh, and, and and political parties, especially from from AMNO and also from from PAS, uh, the Islamist Party, uh, they have been basically uh, using it as a as a tool to uh, garner support and uh, and obedience. Um, but in doing so, uh, as Azrul had said. Uh, sometimes it lends towards a very dogmatic interpretation on on Islam, whereby uh, you know uh, uh, mm. it is only one way of interpretation that matters. Uh, and sometimes it leads down the slippery slope towards uh, militancy, as we have seen. Uh, many many Malaysians uh, 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 they have they have gone down uh, to to Syria uh, uh, in a you know mis, in a, in a misguided mm -hmm. belief that by them uh, fighting there they would uh, have a one way ticket to heaven. Sure. Claire, let's, let's bring in a subject that you did mention at the top uh, of this programme and that we do have to, is related to what we're seeing now. And of course, it comes at a time, this whole act comes in at a time where the Prime Minister is fighting corruption allegations uh, for siphoning off nearly $700 million from a state investment fund, 1MDB, as you mentioned. The US Department of Justice, as you alluded to, of course, saying that it's going to try and uh, seize assets of nearly $3.5 billion through the courts. Is enacting the National Security Act just bad timing or just coincidence? Um, I don't think it's bad timing. I think it's deliberate. Um, I think uh, that it is less to protect Malaysians than to protect a Malaysian leader. Um, I'm, I'm very certain that this is a power grab uh, by the Prime Minister in order to defend a very beleaguered position. Um, look at some of the countries that have had extraordinary problems with terrorist attacks. Yes, Malaysia has problems, but what about France or Belgium or any of the other countries that have experienced appalling terrorism? Have they felt it necessary to bring in laws that allow people to be shot dead with impunity by the armed forces on the order of a prime minister? Have they brought in laws that allow people to be arrested um, without a warrant, without a reason, um, and um, you know, without any kind of um, term, term of, of imprisonment uh, determined before trial? Mm. Um, no, this is, this is a law that goes beyond uh, what any other country has appeared to find necessary in order to tackle terrorism. And in fact, it doesn't tackle terrorism. If you're going to have to tackle terrorism, it needs an intelligent approach not this kind of bulldozing of buildings, um, sealing off of areas, a mass intimidation of a population. Mm. Malaysia is not a seething army of discontent. Uh, we're talking about isolated individual troublemakers within a very peaceful po population. Um, and uh, so, so for that reason, I, I would advocate that this is far more complex mm. um, and has far less to do with the terrorist threat than the government might like to, uh, to make out. And there we must leave it for the moment, uh, Claire. But let's just tell our global viewers that we did, at every opportunity in preparation for this programme, invite the Malaysian government to represent themselves. They were unable to put up anybody uh, to speak to us. So I think we've had as balanced a uh, conversation uh, on Inside Story this particular uh, day. To all of my guests, uh, Eric Paulson, Claire Rucastle-Brown, and also to uh, Azrul Mohammed Khalib, thanks so much for joining us on Inside Story. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website at aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter at our handle, and that's at AJ Inside Story. From me, Sahil Rahman, and the whole team here, thanks for your time and your company. Bye-bye.